What I want to talk today, about today is a line of research I've been doing uh, for uh, roughly speaking the last uh, 10 years of my life and I can just give you bits and pieces of it of course I'll try to weave it into a more or less coherent story that Eric anticipated. Uh, what I think we need in my field, cognitive science, is something like translational educational science, some way to take what we are doing in the laboratory and eventually if we find something interesting and important to get it to education. Psychologists have now been studying learning and memory since the time of Herman Ebbinghaus, which has been about 130 years, using experimental methods. Uh, and so we can ask the question, well, after this 130 years, what, what have you done for us? What, what changes have been made in education as the basis of a tremendous amount of research by many people? And the answer, I think, is quite simple. Nothing at all has changed in education as a function of anything uh, cognitive psychologists have done. And I don't mean there haven't been inroads. I mean, intelligent tutors, there are, I can point to things that have had limited success, uh, often in small classes with demonstrations, but if you ask, is the average fourth grader learning differently because of what people like me have done over the last 130 years, uh, my estimate is not really. Um, in fact, we're still doing lots of things wrong, I would say, in fourth grade that could be easily corrected, but they don't, uh, don't know the research to know how. So what I'm trying to promulgate with this line of work is taking, uh, the way psychologists like to do research in my field is use really simple materials, things like a word list and picture lists, stories maybe if you get ambitious, uh, and uh, study those and learn all about uh, these simple systems. And the hope is, the belief is, that we're really studying what humans do and they learn and remember. Uh, but unless you scale those up to complex materials, more things, more like things people do in classrooms, uh, it's hard to get attention to, of teachers or educators. Uh, and then eventually you have to go, if you can scale them up and if they survive, they almost always do, uh, then you really need to take them in the classroom and show they really work in the classroom. This is a very, very hard step. Um, I'm doing it now and I realize how hard it is. People used to ask me, well, how come more kind of psychologists don't work in the classroom? I'd say, I don't know. Well, now I know. It's really, really hard. It takes a lot of money uh, and it's very difficult work, but we are trying it now. Uh, we also, when we talk to teachers and students and learners, we get ideas for future research and then ideally we come back to the lab and see if we can make some of those ideas work under controlled situations and start the whole process again. Um, so uh, let me just start with a simple question. What activities lead to learning? We did a survey where we asked Washington University undergraduates this question. This is a survey that was kind of tacked on the end of a whole lot of experiments. Uh, just say, you've got a test coming up in a couple of weeks. What do you do to get ready for the test? You've heard the lectures, maybe you've read the book once. Now what do you do to really study, to really learn this stuff? And here, the top three here are what uh, the great majority of the students told us that they do. They reread the material. They have highlighted it, they've underlined it. Uh, their books are often very colorful, in fact. Um, and now they're doing this on electronic. Uh, they also review their notes from class. Some of the really ambitious ones say they rewrite the notes from class. That's very small proportion. Uh, and then the bottom three here, a few students memorize, uh, or suggested these kinds of things. They use uh, explicit strategies to memorize. They outline the material in the book. Uh, they form study groups and so forth. But uh, basically it was the first three uh, which aren't terrible strategies, but they're much more effective ones they could be using. Uh, and then if we ask, well, how do we measure learning? Well, we all uh, at universities know that. We give quizzes and tests, essays and exams. But, there's, but we don't give many of them in universities typically. I taught introductory psychology for many years. Often I give uh, three tests and a final exam, or maybe the third test was the final exam. Um, and what I want to suggest uh, in the rest of my talk is maybe we have this backwards. Maybe these activities at the bottom here actually will promote learning much better than the activities at the top. If we built in more quizzing, more testing into our classes, not, I'm not talking about standardized testing, 
Now that's something psychologists have had a big effect on education. Um, but, uh, but I'm talking about more of the standard daily quiz, the uh, frequent tests, giving essays, giving assignments, that kind of thing. And I'll try to tell you in the next uh, 15 minutes why I believe that would be helpful. Uh, when you go to the experimental psychology of learning and memory, uh, dating from 1885 on, one very common technique to use, uh, and it shows exactly the same assumptions that we have in education, that study episodes, the idea is to use a study test paradigm. Study some material, you test people on it, they study it again, test people on it, so forth and so on, and then you've got a beautiful learning curve that you see in many textbooks. Uh, and the assumption is that the study phase in these experiments is when the learning occurs, and the test phase is simply in there to show the expression of learning that was acquired on the previous study phase. So studying is where the action is. Testing is just something we do, kind of like dropping a dip dipstick in the brain to measure how much knowledge is in there and to give students grades. Um, so here's uh, a typical learning curve. This is from, just I just picked because I happen to have it, uh, Indel Solving, learning, students learning uh, a list of words just mean performance, uh, number of words recalled. Uh, there are only 16 words in the list, so it, it levels off. But this shaped learning curve occurs everywhere. Um, is that all there is? Are these assumptions correct? Are, are tests really just neutral events that just measure learning? And what many people have shown, I'm just going to give you some examples from my own research. Um, uh, here's just one from, uh, with a student named Mark Wheeler published uh, uh, over 20 years ago, uh, we were doing an experiment for a totally different reason that I'm not going to describe to you. But people, uh, the students in the experiment who were Rice University undergraduates, they heard a story, they saw there were objects mentioned in the story, and whenever uh, 60 of these objects were mentioned, a picture would pop up. They were told to be sure to remember those pictures. They'd write down the names of the pictures. The name was given in the story. There are a whole bunch of conditions, but I'm going to simplify for these purposes. And then after this initial learning phase, they heard the story, they'd seen the pictures, uh, either they went home and came back a week later, they didn't take any tests the first day, or they received one test the first day. Uh, when they received that test, they got about 32 of the pictures, uh, or they received three tests. They just, they, the test was they got a blank sheet of paper, they had to recall the pictures in any order they wanted to uh, for seven minutes, and. In the three test condition, they just did that three times. We'd take away the first sheet of paper, give them a second sheet, they'd do it again. We told them try to recall uh, all the things they'd recall before and new ones if they could. Uh, and anyway, they did it three times and then everybody came back a week later, all three groups of people. And what I'm going to show you is what happened on the delayed test. So here's retention a week later. Uh, and what you see here is that the group that um, had uh, no tests the first week, got about 17 of the words, 17, 18, somewhere in there. Uh, the group that had three tests the week before, they, they'd studied the same way. They heard the same story, read the things. If they recalled them three times the week before, they basically didn't show any forgetting. They were still at 32. Uh, but if they had just studied, if they just heard the story without practicing retrieving it, they uh, did about half as well. Uh, so taking a test is a powerful memory enhancer. I could go on, I'll, I'll be going on and on, in fact, for the rest of my time showing you this. Uh, but here is one simple demonstration of it. William James knew this. Here's his famous book in 1890, Principles of Psychology. And he had this great passage in there. A uh, curious peculiarity of our memory is things are impressed better by active than by passive repetition. I mean when learning by heart, when we almost know the piece, it pays better to wait and recollect by an effort from within than to look at the book again. If we recover the words the former way, we'll probably know them the next time. In the latter way, we'll probably need the book again. So the idea is if you retrieve something yourself, if you produce it by what James calls an effort within, you'll remember it better. And that's essentially uh, what we show. A and this is called the, the testing effect, uh, the retrieval practice effect. 
uh, Ralph Putnam, who's on the faculty here. Uh, his son is a graduate student in my lab, and uh, Adam Putnam is doing, uh, uh, should have tried to work some of his work into this talk, but he's been doing interesting work on the testing effect um, for years with me now uh, at, at Washington University, one of my graduate students. Uh, Jeff Karpicki and I, a former graduate student uh, who's now at Purdue University, um, he and I wrote a big review of what was known about the testing effect in 2006, retrieval practice effect, uh, and the basic finding, there are lots of qualifications, but retrieval practice greatly promotes uh, retention. And also it helps us in the use of information, that in education the metaphor is often getting information into a student's head. Well, the big problem, as I see it, is not so much getting it in, it's getting them to use it when they need it, getting them to practice uh, uh, solving that problem, practice retrieving it on some later occasion when they really need to use it, whether it be a test or whether it be outside of school. And that's what retrieval practice does. It pra helps to practice getting information uh, out of memory as uh, well as helping it be uh, acquired better for future use. One question Jeff and I asked was, can, the, the standard way psychologists do learning experiments seems really clunky to everybody, including psychologists. Namely, you study a whole set of material, you're tested on that whole set of material, you study the whole other set, do it again, and uh, if you look at study guides, I've been to our medical school bookstore, they have uh, flashcard sets for everything in medical school. They have, uh, so the muscular system, the skeletal system, the nervous system, all the systems you have to learn, all the neurotransmitters, all uh, the various kinds of hormones, they all have these big flashcard sets. So I always enjoy looking at the instructions for the flashcards, and they say the same thing, that what you should do is study something, test yourself, once you show you know it, once you've gotten it right a time or two, drop it out of what, then you know it. Drop it out and now study, concentrate on the stuff you don't know. So this is the dropout method of doing this. And it's much more efficient than what, than this, you know, study everything, test on everything, study everything, test on everything. Uh, so Jeff and I did an experiment on this. We just did a wordless experiment. I'm still in the basic research phase of the talk. Uh, and we just had people learn 40 words and uh, so they'd study 40, say they recall five on the first trial, next time they'd study 35, but we dropped them out as soon as they recalled them once. And then we looked at how fast learning occurred, how fast could students recall the words. And what we found was what lots of other people have found, and this is why it's in everybody's book on how to study. Uh, if you have flashcards or something, drop them out. And you see the learning curve is faster for the dropout group than the standard group the, uh, that um, has, these, has to do it over and over. But what Jeff and I did that hadn't been done by anybody before, we always, psychologists tend to assume whatever affects learning, whatever makes learning good, that will make performance good forever. Well, we tested people a week later. We brought them back for a new experiment and gave them a surprise test. Said, oh, by the way, you learned a list of words a week ago. Uh, try to remember as many of those as you can. And what we found was that the standard group did twice as well as the dropout group. So the dropout group displayed very fast learning, but they also displayed fast forgetting. Uh, that despite the ceiling effect, the forgetting was twice as high in the dropout condition as in the standard condition. So there's something about that standard clunky condition that makes uh, performance better over a week. Now this pattern uh, is a very interesting one. Notice, so here's a variable that improves learning. The learning curve is better, but it hurts long-term retention. And uh, Robert Bjork at UCLA and Elizabeth Bjork at UCLA have coined the term, this pattern is seen uh, as a function of several different variables in psychology. And they uh, coined the term desirable difficulties to refer to this pattern. Desirable difficulties are uh, something that makes, oops, sorry, uh, something that makes learning uh, better initially, but then seems to hurt it on the long term. So the standard condition it is a difficult condition. Students don't much like it. It feels like wasted effort, but there's something good about it. 
It's a desirable difficulty in the Bjork's terms. So we can ask, well, what is it about it that makes it better? And in the, um, uh, there are two things that it obviously does. When you drop something out, you don't study it anymore. And when you drop it out, you're not tested on it anymore. So which is it? Is it increased study opportunities, retrieval opportunities, or both? And so I don't have time to go through the whole sets of lines of work we did on this, but the bottom line conclusion is that it's repeated retrieval. That's why the standard condition is good. You can drop stuff out of study. You can do selective dropout experiments. As long as you keep people retrieving the stuff, that's what's good about the standard condition. And after you get to some criterion of being perfect and you want to keep practicing, repeated study really does very little, uh, almost nothing in some of our experiments. And repeated retrieval is the key to long-term retention. Uh, now, repeated, obviously, studying is good in the first place. You have to study enough to be able to retrieve once. But after retrieving it once or twice, additional retrieval practice helps, but additional study practice doesn't. And the results are in the uh, paper cited there at the bottom. Um, so we find this over and over with simple laboratory materials like word lists and picture lists that retrieval practice is good. So next we tried to scale up to more complex uh, text-like materials. We didn't use actual textbook materials, but uh, like that. 250 word prose passages about a variety of topics. We used, I remember one was about sea otters. So people read a passage about sea otters. Uh, and we here are four different conditions. One is they simply read the passage four times. Uh, actually, they read it more than that. They were given four opportunities, little breaks in between each one, but they read and read and read the passage. Uh, another group read it three times and took a single test at the end. So, uh, uh, and the other group only read it once, but then took three tests. The test, by the way, again, a blank sheet of paper. Uh, you get the title Sea Otters at the top. Recall as much of the passage as you can. And so they got about, on the test, they got about 70% of the idea units in the passage were expressed on the test. So notice in the pure study case, they get 100% of the material every time. But say in the bottom case, they get 100% the first time, then they retrieve on their own about 70% um, the other times. So after they'd done this first phase, we asked them uh, to make a... Um, what's called a meta-memory judgment. How well do you think you'll do? We're going to give you a test on this passage in a week. How well do you think you'll do? Um, where one was not very well and seven was very well. And then we either gave them a test five minutes later, just almost immediately, or for a different group of people, we brought them back a week later. Uh, so let's look at the group uh, we brought back a week later first. Oh, first, let me show you how they, set, how they predicted they would do. What do students know about their own knowledge? Uh, how well they'll do a week later in these three conditions. And here was a prediction. Uh, predicted recall was, think about it, the group that had been studying it over and over was sick of this passage. They were sick of sea otters. I'll never forget this passage. This guy has made me read it uh, four times. Uh, so they predicted they'd do the best. If they got one test, they said, oh, it's a little harder than I thought. Uh, their ratings came down. If they only studied once and got three tests, the ratings were the worst. Now let's look at how they did a week later. And the answer is they did the opposite of what they predicted. Uh, if they took three tests, they did the best. If they took one test, they did next. And just like the Wheeler and Rotator study, if they didn't take any tests, uh, they did the worst. So taking the test greatly augmented learning, long-term retention, but the students didn't recognize that. Everybody says, oh, put student learning in their own hands. Well, students really don't know when they're learning and when they aren't sometimes, because how do you know how much you're going to know a week later? It's uh, difficult. What did they know? Remember, there was a group that we tested after only five minutes. Oh, well, what the students were predicting was how well they could do right now. Because if you test them immediately after the learning phase, the people who studied it a whole lot did fine. They did better than the group that only studied it once and took three tests. Um, so this is the cramming effect that our students all know. If you're taking a test in five minutes, yes, just read it over and over and you'll do fine. Uh, if you want to know it a week later, that's a really lousy thing to do, but that's what our students often do. Um, 
So um, this is, again, the idea that retrieval practice really enhances learning, but students can't recognize that. How would they know that that's so good unless they've had that experience? In fact, once we give them the experience and we tell them, now you have your choice. Do you want to reread or test yourself? They say, oh, I'd rather reread it. So it's very hard to get this point across to them, even in laboratory settings. So move to the classroom. As I mentioned, we've been trying to do this. I'm going to tell you about just one study from a middle school classroom. We've been doing this for years now in middle schools, high schools, and in university settings, also in our medical school uh, with a colleague named Doug Larson, a neurologist. Uh, and what we've done uh, is to do what's pretty unusual in education with, uh, within student design. So instead of assigning classrooms or schools to different conditions, each student does each condition in a very uh, counterbalanced order across a number of uh, classes. And basically, for some of the material, uh, the students receive quizzes on the material, low, zero stakes quizzes in the classroom. They just get tests on some material we identify. Other material is, is the teacher lectures on it, they read about it, it's all the same. It's just a standard condition of what they would be doing in class. But then we select some items for quizzing. But again, across all uh, students, uh, everything's counterbalanced, so there's no difference in the material. And also, the teacher is outside the classroom when this happens. This is a research assistant we have sitting in the class. The teacher gets to leave uh, for five minutes while these quiz on the days that quizzes are called for. Um, so it's just basically the same kind of experiment. But now we do it in the classroom, and we do it over the course of the whole school year in a number of different classes. So it's a very uh, um, difficult experiment to implement. We have to have a uh, person in the classroom the whole time. But it worked. Uh, here's um, uh, on uh, the students. Got, we're also using, we're not using special material. This is really the material that the, the teacher just gave us the textbooks, and we created the quizzes. On chapter exams, where students get grades uh, for the items that have been quizzed, 91% performance on the eventual chapter exam, 74% uh, if they had been quizzed. Se teacher said 74% was about what she expected to get, because that's what she usually got. So we can take, in this case, a set of material and greatly raise it from um, uh, performance. We also tested people at the end of the semester on these things. That also counted for their grade. Uh, and this one year, the reason I'm showing this particular set of results from Journal of Educational Psychology, uh, which Art Racer edits, um, is that we also, they gave us permission. It didn't count for their grade, but they had some extra time at the end of the school year uh, in June after and we tested them on stuff they had October, November, the year before. And we showed there was still a measurable effect. It's not huge, 7%, uh, but I've been asking people, what other educational interventions can you tell me that last the whole school year? And people have been drawing blanks when I ask them that, but this one seems to. Uh, and we've done this, this is just one experiment of probably now 25 we've done of, of this sort. Uh, there we go. Uh, so in conclusion, yes, retrieval practice benefits learning and memory. We've shown this is effective besides in the lab, in middle school classrooms, high school classrooms, I forgot to put that, several different kinds of university classrooms, and uh, in several studies of medical students and residents in medical residents in education. Um, this, uh, a lot of this, this book just came out last week, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning by uh, Peter Brown, a professional writer, me, Mark McDaniel, a colleague who also studies uh, applying cognitive psychology to education, available on Amazon as of April Fool's Day, I was told. Um, not sure what the, hope that was a coincidence. Uh, but we've put a lot of this uh, work into this, this book, uh, but it's also about lots of other things besides uh, retrieval practice. Um, and finally, thanks uh, my lab. Uh, here's. Uh, Michigan's East Lansing home, Adam Putnam down here. Um, and um, thank you for your attention, and I hope I didn't go over too much. Thanks.